Hello everybody, my name is Katie Davidson. I'm the Program Director at Chattanooga State's Respiratory Care Program. And today we're going to do a virtual info session for Chattanooga State's Respiratory Care Program. This is a program that offers an Associate in Applied Science degree. So Chattanooga State's Respiratory Care Program has a bit of an interesting history that I'll tell you about. So first, the program started up at Cleveland State up in 1961. Um, and it transitioned to its current location here at Chattanooga State main campus in 1981. And so technically or currently, um, Chattanooga State maintains the oldest um, nationally accredited associate degree level program in the country. Um, we produce more registered uh, respiratory therapists in our area than any other school. Um, and we certainly um, fill a lot of positions at a lot of the uh, regional hospitals as well. Now, one thing about Chattanooga State that we're currently undergoing is we have been a traditionally a six semester program. So our students would start in the fall and they would go fall, spring, summer, fall, spring, summer. And so one thing that we've um, that one thing that we've made ch significant changes to the program is we're going from six semesters down to five. OK, so instead of graduating the following summer, um, students would actually graduate at the end of spring term, which is pretty nice. And, and so that's actually going to allow some students to be a lot more competitive um, with other affiliating schools that are close by that also attend clinical sites. One thing about our students is when they get ready to take their uh, board exams, um, they have always been in the top 10% nationally with the board pass rates, which is pretty impressive and pretty significant. And so I would say anybody that's interested in looking at uh, various school outcomes to go to COARC's website. It's um, COARC is the Commission on Accreditation for Respiratory Care. They actually are the accrediting body for various respiratory care schools across the across the nation. And so if you go to their website, www.coarc.org, you can actually verify um, uh, outcomes from various schools. So a little bit about the program faculty. Um, I mentioned earlier um, in the introduction that I'm Katie Davidson. I am the program director and assistant professor. Um, I actually have my experience uh, in the adult realm. I do a lot of adult critical care. Uh, I've got nearly 20 years experience uh, in that. John Cousineau is our director of clinical education. He is an associate professor and John has nearly 40 years experience and he is well versed in um, adult critical care and he's also a, a paramedic, um, specially trained in that realm. Stephanie Bramlett is our newest faculty member with about eight years experience. Um, she is an instructor and she comes to us from children's hospitals. So she has lots of neonatal uh, and ECMO experience. Um, so all three of us teach uh, students in at least several segments throughout the program. Um, you know, some of us may teach just first years or a mix of first and second years or strictly second year students, but all three of us are also very involved in the clinical setting as well. We do have some adjunct faculty I didn't list, um, but we have those, those uh, faculty members that primarily help out with our clinical courses. Um, and so they may be on campus or also in the clinical setting with students. I have posted a link here for a video that's uh, very nice to watch if you're interested a little bit more in learning about respiratory care uh, as, a, as a profession, if you don't already uh, know a little bit about it. This is actually posted from the aarc.org website. So what is a respiratory therapist? Because a lot of times people confuse us as either being physicians of some sort or mid-level practitioners or a nurse. Um, and we are our own specialty, our own profession. Um, and we evaluate, treat, and care for patients with a variety of breathing disorders, okay? They can be primary from the lungs, but there are also a lot of patients that we take care of that have breathing problems because of something else going on with them, say, such as a heart failure patients. RTs can specialize in many different specific areas, such as adult critical care, pediatrics, neonatal, diagnostic pulmonary function test, diagnostic bronchoscopy lab, 
emergency and trauma, transport, management, education, sales, and research. Why should you consider a career as a respiratory therapist? The answer to that question should be simple. You're empathetic. You want to help people. You want to help people at their worst moments, okay? And that's a great answer. But maybe you have an interest in working with premature babies when they can't breathe very well. Or you have an interest in working with elderly patients, people that have COPD or asthma. Maybe you're an adrenaline junkie and want to, you know, help out in trauma. You want to help people save lives. And that's really what we do as respiratory therapists. We are so specialized in a field. Instead of knowing um, a little about a lot of topics, we know a lot about a little um, segment of the body. We are well-versed in the lungs as well as the heart. Uh, and even the kidneys play an intricate role in lung function and, and breathing. And so hopefully you might have an interest in working with those regions. Um, if you have an interest in technology, you can grasp things and learn things pretty well. Um, you know, respiratory care is certainly an evolving, uh, evolving field when it comes to technology, ventilators, ECMO machines, uh, in non-invasive machines, hemodynamics, all of these things we utilize, particularly in the critical care setting. Hopefully you don't want to be a respiratory therapist because you're seeking a desk job because most respiratory therapists do not work behind a desk. Um, most respiratory therapists um, typically work three days. Uh, if they're full-time uh, at a hospital, they work three 12 hour shifts a week. Okay. So hopefully you're not wanting some sort of a, uh, you know, five day a week desk job where you're pushing papers because um, we don't do that nowadays. So a brief overview of what respiratory therapists do is take care of patients. So similar to a nurse would have a set of patients that they would take care of, we do too. Um, we are not the primary communicator between the physician and um, the nurse. The nurse would be the, the primary uh, point person on that. But nonetheless, we do have a, a caseload of patients that we would expect to see throughout our shift. Okay. Um, a lot of times we're going to be aerosolizing medications to patients, so we do give medications, whether it be um, inhalation through uh, nebulizers, through MDIs. Um, there's various different ways that, that uh, patients can be given medications. Also, we're going to assess and recommend therapy. So this is one thing that I would say is a little bit different than other allied health professions. Um, because we are so specialized in the area of treating respiratory patients, Physicians and other allied health professionals, nurses, they really rely on us to assess the patient um, and also give recommendations um, for what we feel would help improve the situation. Management of life support equipment is a big part, especially if you work critical care ICU or the ER or transport. We do manage uh, all the ventilators. So in some facilities, RTs are actually intubating patients and we're putting them on life support. A physician also is involved in that. We don't do everything um, as far as orders, but uh, we are the ones to actually take care of the patient at the bedside on the machine. We perform critical lab tests. So critical lab tests really would kind of go into aerial um, arterial blood gas analysis as well as some other labs that certain facilities may have respiratory therapists do. ABGs is a type of blood draw. We draw it from the artery. So um, this is a really useful type of test to assess for oxygenation and, and acid base balance in a lot of our patients. We administer oxygen therapy. So we can go from simple nasal cannula to more advanced types of oxygen devices. In the acute care setting, respiratory therapists respond to all emergencies in the hospital. That's rapid responses, that's code blues, or code 99s in some facilities is what they may call it. We're the ones to assess the patient if respiratory distress is noted. We're gonna be the ones either to intubate or to assist in the intubation and transport to the ICU. Pulmonary function measurements in the outpatient lab. So I have some patients um, that may be um, getting work done for um, pre-op 
before surgery, or maybe they've had a chronic condition, so the physician is wanting to monitor their progress annually or biannually. So a lot of times, the RTs are going to be the ones working in those labs or physician's offices doing pulmonary function measurements. Another thing that's essential for respiratory therapists is to have good communication skills, and you have to have uh, equally strong critical thinking skills. So one thing about being a respiratory therapist is since we assess and we also recommend therapy, you have to be able to communicate that with the physician. Um, part of the program is also to get people, um, to get students well, um, kind of over the, the nerves of communicating with physicians, to pull people out of their shell, um, because you have to be a patient advocate um, for for the patient. And so you need to make sure you can speak up. And when th something that you feel needs to be uh, changed or modified, that you're able to do that effectively uh, as well. So a little bit of statistical information. This is actually from um, the U.S. Um, Bureau of Labor and Statistics uh, as of 2018. So the data is a little, a little, um, I say two years old, but actually they, it's, it's the most current data that's out there. So currently the number of RTs employed in the United States is 129,600, okay? There's a lot of therapists graduating and taking their boards and becoming eligible as RTs, but there's also a lot of um, therapists that are actually retiring out of the profession as well. Currently in the state of Tennessee, we have 3,520 registered respiratory therapists. So as far as a professional outlook, the growth is, is really good. Uh, it's 21%, it's much faster than a lot of other uh, allied health professions. And particularly with the current situation, the pandemic um, that we're facing, um, the professional outlook actually is gonna be a lot stronger than that, I anticipate. So a little bit about the work environment. I mentioned earlier that a lot of the respiratory therapists do work in acute care settings, that would be hospitals. 83% actually do work in acute care facilities. There are about 5% of RTs that work in nursing care facilities, and so these would be places kind of like uh, Kindred or Standard for Place that still might have patients that require mechanical ventilation, so they're going to need respiratory therapists to, to manage those machines. And then even a smaller number of RTs work in uh, private physician offices, about 2%. So let's talk a little bit about salary. So the average salary um, in Tennessee is 62,500 a year, okay? Now, there is a little bit of discrepancy in this because this is the mean salary of everybody who's working in the field, new graduates all the way up to seasoned professionals. Um, on average, the PRN pay is about $30.05 per hour. So if you're not well-versed or not knowledgeable about PRN um, positions, PRN positions are non-full-time positions. Those are positions where you don't have insurance, um, you don't get sick time, you don't get vacation time, um, but the flip side is you may get paid more per hour to work, okay? The, one of the big disadvantages is that they don't offer benefits, and if workload does happen to drop off, um, then you're gonna be the first person to be let go, at least for the day or for the shift. So how to become a respiratory therapist. So this is pretty important um, because anybody who's interested as a respiratory therapist, the entry level education is going to be an associate's degree um, from a program like Chattanooga State. Now, there is a lots of information. There's lots of different schools. The minimum degree you can have in a, is an associate degree. They also, they, we have partnerships with uh, ETSU um, where students can actually further their degree um, in respiratory care and actually graduate with a BS. And I think even nationwide, there are some master's degree programs. But let's talk a little bit about specific program information if you're interested in pursuing um, the program. Applicants have to be admitted to the college um, before you can actually apply to a program within the college. Okay, so that's very first and foremost. The deadline for the actual program is going to be May 15th each year. It never changes. So May 15th of 2025, May 15th of 2020 is going to be the deadline. One thing about the program courses, so if you look at the curriculum, which I'm actually going to go over in the next couple slides, the program curriculum, you have to have um, a C or better in all of your courses. Okay. Now one thing that's important about um, um, prerequisites, because sometimes programs may have prerequisites, 
as a respiratory program, we don't technically have prerequisites. We have general education courses. And so what that means is we don't require you to have certain courses to be um, accepted into the program. But, and I say this with a, with a strong but, most applicants have taken AMP 1 and 2 and micro and maybe some of the other general education courses. So if you are in a position to have already taken those classes, you're going to be in a better position to be accepted into the program. Um, one thing that's new um, with a math requirement is that before we actually weren't requiring math, but now we are requiring intro to statistics. So that would be math 1530. So if you happen to be somebody that is interested in, in a couple different allied health professions, um, you don't have to take specifically math 1530, but say you're taking, um, you want to take, or you've had a pre-calculus class because uh, Rad Tech may require that, that would be acceptable for us as well. So we don't really care if it's exactly 1530, but it has to be at least a math 1530 or higher. Um, let me jump back up to the, uh, the um, anatomy and physiology and the micro, the, all the uh, biological sciences. If you've taken those, um, it's important that they have to be um, taken within the last five years of entry into the program, okay? So since it's 2020, if you took something, um, say, back in, in uh, 2014, um, you say you took all your sciences back in 2014, those would have to be retaken um, in order to meet newest, the newest guidelines. There are exceptions to that, um, and there's not many students that actually do fall into this exception, but if you have taken uh, those courses within um, seven years, so let, greater than five, but no more than seven years, and you've had a B or better, then those courses may be waived. But that would be something that you'd have to um, certainly request. So when we look at the minimum GPA of the program, minimum GPA are program courses, whether it be general education courses or actual program classes. You have to maintain at least a 2.5 or higher GPA. Okay, so once again, the higher GPA you have, the better you're um, going to be in a position for uh, acceptance into the program. The TEAS test is required for application um, into the program as well. And so I think this is something that every uh, allied health and nursing program requires. Um, and so you have, as far as a benchmark goes, um, every category is graded and you need to have at least what I tell students is you need to have at least a 60% benchmark in each of those categories, okay? Now, I put a couple asterisks next to it because that's kind of a floating um, number, 60%. Um, one year when I may have um, a really high number of applicants, that's certainly going to be an influenced by the, the top students who have the best T-scores. If I have students that have gotten um, low on the T-scores, those, um, you know, those students may not have um, the best chance of getting into a program with lower T-scores. So just kind of be aware of that um, because that is going to be fluid. But I'll actually review over um, the most current incoming class T-scores. Let me talk a little bit about the curriculum, at least for the first year students on this page. Um, so this is laid out as if somebody didn't have any of the general education requirements um, taken. Okay. Now, in in the course of the of the um, in the history of the program, I think we've only had two students come in straight from high school going into the program. Um, those students are now CFOs and um, higher higher ups in in different professions. So most people actually do have. Um, usually taken some of these things ahead of time, and we'll go over that. English Comp 101, HMP uh, 1, which is uh, Human Anatomy and Physiology, Intro to Statistics, Fundamentals of Respiratory Care, and a Cardiopulmonary AMP class that is specific to respiratory. Okay, so there's really two respiratory classes that first semester, and those other three classes are what we consider your general education courses. So a lot of times when students get accepted in the program that have already taken general ed education classes, the only classes that they may need to be signed up for would be RASP 1410 and RASP uh, 1412. 
One thing that's important to, to realize that um, if students are concerned about financial aid requirements, um, I know that financial aid, um, there are certain um, exceptions to the rule. And so when students are on a financial aid, if they happen to um, get accepted into a program and the program hours may not be full time by definition of what their standard, the, the scholarship or uh, financial aid definitions of full time would be 12 hours. When you are in a specific program, those exceptions are waived. So in this case, if you're looking at the first year, fall semester, if you've taken those three courses at the top and all you have to do is those eight credit hours of respiratory classes, then you would still be able to receive financial aid. In the second year of the program, or the second semester, second semester of the program, there's uh, biology, uh, 2020, which is our anatomy and physiology two, cardiopulmonary physiology, intro to clinical practice, cardiopulmonary um, pharmacology, fundamentals of respiratory care two, and of course there's going to be a humanities and fine arts general elective. Those things are going to be pretty much steadfast, and so um, unless you've taken some of the other general electives, um, then you would still be required to take those one, two, four respiratory classes in the spring. And in the summer, we do have courses in the summer. We are a year-round program. Um, in the summertime, students would take um, three courses or at least two classes if they've already taken care of the microbiology. Now, looking at this curriculum up here, the um, intro to clinical practice is not necessarily going to be clinic in the hospital setting. That's going to get prepare students for clinic. Um, typically, students actually start clinical internships, clinical settings, clinical hours is going to be the RASP 1399 course. Now the second, the second year of the program um, would begin fall of the following year. And at this point, students are really expected to really just be taking um, primarily respiratory classes. Um, there are some exceptions to that where students may still be requiring um, to complete their general education courses that are in the fine arts, or humanities um, or English, but um, generally all of the three biological sciences, anatomy and physiology one and two, and also micro, all three of those classes have to be completed by start of the second semester. And the reason why that is, is because our training gets a little bit more in depth and you're not gonna have time to complete those other courses because those typically also entail a lab um, that goes along with them. Okay, so the second um, semester in the second year would be spring, and there's really just three courses that students are required to take at this point. Uh, one is a board prep class, which is the respiratory care seminar, where we prepare you to successfully um, prepare for taking the, the real board exam when you graduate. Um, there's a, also a clinical uh, component to it as well, and then a special topics in respiratory care. So one thing that's important, certainly in the in the third um, the third course of clinicals, okay, which would be um, the RESP 2465. That particular course, um, we will do 12-hour shifts in the hospital, um, and so this is really to prepare students to get used to really how it's going to be like when they graduate, because uh, most of us do work in the acute care setting, and those shifts, those those uh, work hours are typically going to be like 6.30 in the morning until 6.30 in the evening. So those are going to be a little bit longer shifts, but you only have to do two of those per day. I'm um, sorry, two of those per week. So you're doing 24 hours of clinical in the last semester, and in the other terms um, where clinic is required, those are typically going to be three days, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, um, that are typically about seven and a half hours each, okay? Um, we do more clinical hours than any other allied health program, and I think that's one thing that's been really beneficial for our program success. Like our students literally um, can hit the floor running and are prepared and can handle most situations um, because they've spent so much more time in clinical and uh, assessing patients and troubleshooting and, and learning to be able to communicate uh, with as, as a part of the team. 
So some information for um, respiratory points calculator. So on this screen right here, and you can actually do this if you go to Chattanooga State's website and look at, at Nursing Allied Health and um, specifically select the respiratory care um, homepage. Down on the bottom um, left side of the screen, there's different options for you to, um, you know, for information on your T test, for your respiratory points calculator, respiratory care requirements. And all this information is right here on the internet. So if you wanted to really see how you lined up with your points, um, this is a really useful tool to do this. So you wanna go in, if you've taken courses before, um, particularly your biological science, any of your general education classes, you can go into this and actually put in your, <clears throat> excuse me, your grades up in these particular boxes. Just use the little drop down arrow and enter your grade in. Now. Um, the math grade two, um, because this has not been changed yet, was given an extra point to students who have had a math uh, 1530 or higher. Okay, um, That's going to be standard now, so students aren't going to get an extra point for that. But um, nonetheless, you can still enter your grade in there. Now, chemistry and physics are technically not required for our program, which is important for students that uh, might feel um, if they've taken those courses in the past and have had a good grade, uh, a C or better, then we reward students um, to have taken those courses. So for instance, if you happen to be a chemistry major and then all of a sudden decide one day that you don't want to do, uh, want to do that anymore and you are interested in, in becoming a respiratory therapist, if you've taken five chemistry classes, I'm only going to give you one point. I'm not going to give you five points, only one point. So that's kind of an incentive because that means that you, know, you probably completed some pretty, um, you know, maybe tough courses. And so we reward you for that. Same goes for physics. Also on the same screen, you'll see um, an area where you can put in your T score results. Okay. And so once again, once you get these um, results, you can plug them in here and push this calculate button and at the bottom you're going to see your total points which is 82.87. This is really what we go for um, uh, when we actually start selecting our, our students for the next incoming class. Okay, We don't actually do interviews at this time that may or may not, uh, that may or may not change, I'm not really sure, um, but at this moment we just look at the numbers. So, a little bit about the TEAS information because some students um, have not taken the TEAS and the TEAS test is basically an assessment for allied health students. Um, so really it kind of gives me an idea and other, other program directors um, the potential success of students who take this test. So in theory if you score really well then you have, um, then there's a high probability that you're going to um, complete the program. If you have a very low TEAS test score, then there's a chance that maybe you're um, not strong at completing. Um, nonetheless, it's still a part of the requirement, even though people a lot of times hate taking standardized tests. Um, one thing that I will say that's kind of been, um, that's changed recently is that TEAS test uh, price has gone up by $30. So back, you know, um, back last in December, it was like $65 to take the test. Uh, as of January 1st of 2020, this test price went up to, to $95. And so there's lots of different resources that you can utilize if you feel like you need to prepare for this test um, by checking out books or purchasing books. I know the library might have some resources on campus that you might be able to, uh, to check out or the bookstore as well. Um, the TEAS the test can actually be taken multiple times, so as long as you're willing to pay the $95 fee, you can certainly take it as many times as you want. Um, I will say, however, you, if you score well in one test in, say, math, and then the other one you scored well in the science portion, we don't pick and choose from different tests. So you have to choose which test you want to submit with your results um, for those to be considered for your application process. Now, when you when you need are ready to sign up for the TEAS test, you can do that at the website www.atittesting.com um, to schedule your um, exam. The deadline for this year to take the latest uh, TEAS test would be May 9th, okay, because the May uh, 15th is the deadline for the program. If you take your TEAS test on the 9th and you 
for some reason don't have your results that make sure you let um, make sure you note that on the application if you're able to document that um, we do wait for the end of the term um, so students that are maybe taking some general education courses um, this semester um, we know that a lot of times grades may not be submitted uh, or ready by the 15th before our deadline we still go back and actually verify if you've taken general education courses currently this term we'll go back and verify those classes um, with your grades that you've submitted for it or what you project to have um, made in that course so don't worry we actually do consider courses that you've taken this spring term so some of our most recent statistics on our current freshman uh, cohort that were uh, accepted in fall of 19 we had about probably 35 um, students apply but of those 35 students really only 28 had everything together so I only considered the 28 students that actually had their t-scores their application complete their transcripts um, they were already admitted to the college I, they already had all that stuff so if you don't have all your stuff uh, when you when you apply to the program um, a lot of times you're not even going to get uh, considered now of those initial students 28 applied um, we accepted 19 of those students now our program every fall we can accept up to 25 students okay and the GPAs of those students range anywhere from 288 all the way up to 379 and so the minimum GPA that we accept is 25 you can see that we had enough um, selectivity where we could you know we had a pretty good quality of students that had applied to the program now when I look a little bit deeper at the TEAS test results that they um, that they took the T scores varied kind of across the board now these were all averages so if I take all of those 28 applicants and I add up all of their scores um, and I averaged it out then the reading was um, 75 which is pretty good uh, English is 67 math was 79 science is 60 and uh, composition was 71 so one thing about um, the science portion of the TEAS test and so this is where like if you've taken general education courses already particularly your anatomy and physiology one and two those courses will actually help you um, better on the TEAS test okay because a lot of the fundamentals on those questions that they may ask really kind of come from uh, anatomy and physiology type um, questions from a program director um, some of the some of the components that I feel are really going to be um, important to to um, really kind of be a measure of success would be reading um, reading and science math you know we do we do math uh, in the program but we don't do a lot of crazy complicated math so if somebody happens to score um, you know less than what I you know would like on a benchmark for students to to do that may not necessarily rule you out of being accepted um, reading is by far the most important because I feel like if you're a, if you're a strong reader then you're going to be able to read the the texts that are provided um, or at least uh, required for the courses and you're going to hopefully be able to comprehend that material much easier rather than somebody that happens to have a, a reading score say in the 40s so reading is by far the most important science would be the second um, the second most important because I think once again if you've already taken those general education courses mm -hmm. um, then you're gonna then you're gonna have those courses reflect um, in that science TEAS portion of it and so when I go into teaching cardiopulmonary AMP those students that have had those courses um, really don't feel lost and they kind of they can hang in there as we're going through and learning about um, more in-depth concepts so when you get ready to apply to the program okay or multiple programs because I have had students that applied to nursing rad tech dental hygiene PTA whatever they just kind of applied for everything and just was really wanting to see kind of who accepted them that's perfectly fine we don't uh, we don't hold that against you at all but when you get ready to apply you're gonna to have to make sure you log in to Chattanooga State's um, uh, ID with their your your dedicated user ID and password 
um, you're going to have to select the Allied Health application for 2020. So one thing that I know they have changed uh, with this year because of the COVID-19 and everybody is uh, either working from home or submitting things online and we're really kind of preventing a lot of people from um, moving out in the community is they've opened this platform up to be able to submit those documents, those supplemental documents like your TEAS test results, your transcripts, um, any information that you might need to submit, they have opened this platform up. Now you can actually still mail it if you choose to mail it. Um, and that's not a bad idea if you feel like, um, you know, you don't get confirmation in one way or the other. But nonetheless, yeah, you do have the option to, um, to submit everything online digitally. Um, this next slide right here basically just kind of goes back through completing and printing out the application. I always think it's a great idea to, to make a copy, uh, whether it be a digital copy or um, a printed out copy that you have for yourself in the event that someone doesn't receive everything that they need. So kind of keep that in mind um, as you get ready to apply for programs um, with our division. So I'm going to end with I'm a respiratory therapist. What's your superpower? If you have any questions um, that come up after viewing this PowerPoint, please feel free to reach out to me at katherine.davidson at chattanoogastate.edu. Thanks a lot, and I look forward to meeting you soon.